This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue in Romans chapter 12. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are controlled with the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity that we have to study your word. We ask that our minds and hearts will be open to your truth. So we're ready to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 12. Beginning in verse 1, Paul exhorted believers to offer their entire self over to God as a living sacrifice. This is addressed to each and every believer. And we saw that as the believer does this, he takes himself up to level two of the Christian life. Level one is becoming a Christian. Level two is getting to the point where you're fully dedicating yourself over to God. This is giving of oneself entirely over to God mind and body so that one can be transformed to be what God wants him to be. This comes primarily by making the deliberate decision to stop conforming to the world and its ways and to become transformed by the renewing of the mind. The renewing of the mind comes primarily by learning and applying the Word of God. This is also how we know what God's will is. We learn the word, we think the word, we know God's thoughts the matter, and then we obey them. Now in verse 3, we saw Paul's warning for us to not get haughty about our spiritual gifts. Now he hasn't even been to the Roman church yet, but that's something he's probably observed in the church at Corinth. And he wants to bring that up to the Romans before he gets there. To think oneself haughty is to view one better than another because of the spiritual gift or gifts that you have. And this is the subject at this point. We're into the level of uh, level three at this point. We're moving from dedicating ourselves to God to growing to the point where we can use our spiritual gifts. So Paul precedes some of these principles on spiritual gifts with the warning not to get high-minded about your gifts. Now, if you just kind of can set yourself back in a situation, for example, in Corinth. You are among others who have only been saved a couple of years. And you see these miraculous manifestations among the church body. There's a healing, there's a miracle, uh, there's a foreign language being spoken by someone who's never spoken a foreign language in their life, and then someone interprets it, someone provides some prophecy, uh, someone else does some prophecy, another tongue, and this goes on perhaps for a couple hours. Well, this is an exciting setting, to say the least. But at the same time, it should humble one to realize that God is doing this that it's not by your own power, and certainly it's not your natural gift that is doing this, but it is God doing it through you. Now, we saw some of the principles last time regarding spiritual gifts. We saw that the smooth operation of gifts in the body of Christ works with basically three principles. <clears throat> The first principle was that in the body there is diversity. Diversity. All members do not have the same function. And that's important to remember, especially if you think you've developed your gift well and uh, you might want to impose the way you do things on people. But remember, they may not be gifted the same way. All members do not have the same function. The first principle we actually looked at, I got them out of order here, is unity. Unity. Every believer has a place and a purpose 
and the body of Christ. And this in itself should help keep one humble about his own gift. And Paul uses that analogy more than once of the human body. All the parts serve a function. Every member has a place. All right? Now, you may be an arm, and you say, well, I'm kind of important, especially if I'm the right arm, and you consider it a right-handed body. The left arm says, yeah, but I'm important too because there's a lot you can't do without me. And that's absolutely true. But on the other hand, maybe he's left-handed. But anyway, the point is that every believer has a place and a purpose in the body of Christ, the church. The third principle was mutuality. Probably a word you haven't heard much, but basically that's saying we're all members of one body in Christ and individually members one of another. So, we're all members of the body. Let's get some sort of rough body. Probably look more like a gingerbread man, but the idea is that all of us are important. Every part of the body. Without the body, we don't function well. As I use an analogy of a team, you take off a team member or maybe a couple of team members, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're limited, right? You can't play the ball game without a couple of members. So let's keep in mind, first of all, unity, diversity, and mutuality. Now, in verse 6, Paul continues to write about the gifts, using several gifts as examples as to how they are to be exercised in the church body. Verse 6, Since we have different gifts according to grace, a prophecy, let him use it according to the proportion of his faith. All right, the idea that we have different gifts according to grace. Paul begins by making the point that we have different gifts. And they are all according to grace, how God gives them. Over the years, I've heard a lot of teaching on these things, and some of it can be misleading. Let me make this clear. It is a grace gift. It is from God. It's not deserved and not something we had before. It is also in the realm of the supernatural. There's a motivation and energizing or enabling. There's a skill or ability that is outside of our normal range of talents and skills. This means it is not a natural gift. It is from God something you did not have as an unbeliever. It is God working through you in some supernatural way. Three principles according to grace, what that means. God gives it. God enables you to use it. And God gives opportunities to use it. Let me, <clears throat> Let me put these on the board for you. According to grace means God gave it to you, God enables you to use it, God gives opportunities to use it. Now these are all under the assumption that you have moved into the area of giving yourself over to God entirely, that's level two, that you're going to the transformation of the mind, and that you are ready to move on to level three and use your spiritual gifts. <clears throat> Let me say this. You and your gift are a perfect fit. God knows how he wants you to use your gifts. 
and he has placed you in the body of Christ accordingly. That includes your geographical location, your particular circumstances. It may mean working a full-time job. It may be part-time. Or maybe you're in some sort of ministry. But he has put you where you can best benefit the body of Christ. Now that in itself is a humbling thought. You may not be in a place where there's a lot of people. You may be in a place where there's a lot of people, but very few are responding to truth. That is pretty common today. Uh, a lot of people around you, but few are interested in truth. The world has pretty much got them all caught up into what it wants them to do. Well, let's begin to look at some of the gifts here as we move into our passage. The first gift mentioned is prophecy. Paul writes, if prophecy. Now, prophecy is one of the few gifts we really know something about. It is mentioned several times in the New Testament. It has guidelines, and it's pictured in action. Now, of course, prophecy is also not new to the church. That is, we have many Old Testament prophets as well as prophecies. However, we're going to see that New Testament prophet is different than the Old Testament prophet. Let's talk about the gift of prophecy under several points. Point one. The gift of prophecy in the New Testament centered mostly within the local church and body of Christ. By that I mean this is where it primarily operated. In the Old Testament, the gift was used toward the nation of Israel, its kings, but occasionally a prophet would speak to other peoples like Jonah. So it had somewhat of an evangelistic function. Two. The gift of prophecy has two basic functions. The first, the prophet proclaimed the word. 1 Corinthians 14.3, 24 through 25, and verse 31. The second, the prophet predicted what would happen with the word. In other words, he did prophets, prophecy. Acts 11.28, 21, 10 through 11. Now let's talk about the second part in point three. Predictive messages would involve receiving new and special revelation from God. Whereas proclamation, that's the first use of it, would either be known or could include new revelation. 1 Corinthians 14, 29 through 31. It was revelatory, it was a revelatory gift, and that the prophet received revelation from God. Let me chart this out a little bit just to make it as clear as I can. The gift of New Testament prophet. Now, we're not talking about the Old Testament now, and this is not to say that this wasn't true of the Old Testament prophet also. But the New Testament prophet, his gift function in the area of proclamation, and let's just say prediction to make it sound good. Proclamations basically you might call it preaching, exhortation, telling people what the word says. Alright? This would be the benefit to the benefit of the edification of the body of Christ. It might include warning, it might include just comfort, uh, it might include uh, what God wants done in a particular situation. It might include some counsel to an individual. All right? But generally, it was to the local church. Prediction, well, we're familiar with that one, perhaps most familiar with the prophet predicted things that were going to happen in the future. 
This is certainly uh, seen many times in the exercise of prophecy with the Old Testament saints. Uh, the Old Testament gift of prophecy. Now those scripture references, you might want to look those up. Let me put them on the board one more time. The prophet who proclaimed the word, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, 24 through 25 and verse 31. And then we see the prophet in action, predicting, well, this is Agabus in particular, Acts 11, 28, 21, 21, 10, and 11. Now, again, prediction, proclamation would be basically saying what one already knows, or maybe what the people know, or what's what they've received in the word. So it's basically not new revelation. Now, on the other hand, let me let me let me retract that. Cuz I want to make sure we got this sorted out right. Proclamation can be new revelation. It's just that it's not predictive. That's what I'm trying to say. But it doesn't have to be new revelation. Let's put it this way. Old or new revelation. Prediction, well, that would likely be new revelation. You can piece this together in your own mind, understanding what I'm saying here. But the prophet could bring in new revelation. That's why it's called a revelatory, let's see if I spell this right, a revelatory gift. He provided revelation. It might be new. It might not be new if he's just proclaiming it. Or it could be perhaps an old prediction, but still, he also predicted things. So let's be flexible with that usage of the term New Testament prophet. As a revelatory gift, and the prophet received revelation from God. All right? Uh, interesting passage to look at is 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 29 through 31. Okay? Now, 4. This is an interesting one, too. However, the teachings of the prophet were not to go unchecked. Other prophets were to, I use the quote unquote, compare notes so to speak, to assure that what he said was within the range of sound doctrine. 1 Corinthians 14, 29 through 33. How did this happen? How did this work? Well, we get a couple of passages that help us understand this. Point five, the Spirit of God would move within them and reveal to them what they were to say or write. 1 Corinthians 14.30, 1 Peter 1.10-12. Now, we don't have new revelation coming to us today, and we don't have the New Testament gift of prophecy today. It's not needed. We have everything we need until we move into the next phase of God's plan. But what we should understand is that God revealed truth to the prophet in a special way. That's part of having the gift of prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14.30, 1 Peter 1, 10-12. Now, in relation to other gifts in the church at that time, point six, the New Testament gift of prophecy came with other spiritual gifts for the local church at the beginning of the church. Okay? At the beginning. <clears throat> Point seven helps explain. I'm going to have to go to a new, bigger page here. This was part of the New Covenant program instituted on the day of Pentecost with indwelling Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 17 and 18. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, 
I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. This is the fulfillment of Joel's prediction back in Joel 2, the prophet Joel. Now, Peter's saying, this is it. So, we have prophecy coming as a package with uh, the spiritual gifts on the day of Pentecost. Point eight. This gift would serve an important role in the early church. New covenant teachings would come into the church from these prophets, as well as helpful warnings and predictions for the church or individuals. We have an example with Acts 11.27. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this would take place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Now, this group of, what, four verses is very telling. It tells us that one of the purposes of the prophets in the New Testament was to warn the church body of something that was coming, in this case a famine, and they were to get ready for it. And the way they took uh, got ready for it was to take up what they could among those who had means and send it to those who would suffer as a result of this famine. And you see, God provides for his people through his people. Now, this is an important thing when it comes to the function of the church body. Uh, if they were not to help these people, they would suffer. And you don't want members of the body of Christ to suffer needlessly. And it's also an opportunity to give, it's an opportunity to share, it's an opportunity to serve and minister to other believers. And then they, send it, they sent it to them with Barnabas and Saul, to the elders, took it to elders so the elders could have it distributed properly, you see. So this works out beautifully. Uh, we see the gift in action again. Agabus, in fact, again in Acts 21. 10 and 11. I put 14, but 10 and 11 is fine. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. And this way the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So, Agabus, the New Testament prophet, warned Paul, here's what's going to happen to you when you go there. Point eight. We have the mention of two other prophets, Judas and Silas. Acts 15.32, Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. Now notice there's nothing mentioned here about uh, something prophetic in the sense of predictive. This is a good example of proclamation where the prophets proclaim the word, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. Well how do we know they're prophets? Well first of all the scripture says so. Perhaps they had shown some predictive uh, uh, messages earlier, had done some predictive messages earlier. But the point is, we see that Judas and Silas also shared that particular gift, or had that gift. Well, this may surprise you. Point nine, the women 
who had this gift were called prophetesses, only mentioned once in the New Testament. On the next day we left and came to Caesarea, and entering the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him, and this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> stretch that a little bit. Prophetesses. Now, how do they function? In the local church or not? It doesn't say. Were they outside the church and doing some things like Agabus? It doesn't say. All we're told is that even some of the females were giving this gift. And it is a revelatory gift. And it carried some authority. Now these are the daughters of Philip the Evangelist. There's nothing said about what they prophesied, to whom, or how. But they did have the gift. This is one of those passages where you have to be careful and not make something out of it that it doesn't say. Point 10. The use of the gift of prophecy within the gift church assembly. Here we have an example of it. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, especially that you as a church may prophesy. This was such a valuable gift for obvious reasons. It proclaimed revelation, sometimes new revelation, and sometimes new predictive revelation. But it was a valued gift in the church. You would expect that when a prophet stood up to speak that, you know, you could hear a pin drop. Because he would have something valuable for the congregation. Point 11. One that needs to be understood within the framework of the other gifts, particularly the gift of tongues in those days. The gift stood on its own. The gift of prophecy stood on its own. It required no interpreter like the gift of tongues. Now this is also with an understanding that there were other prophets that helped make sure this particular prophecy that was said was kept in line. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and following. For the one speaking in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one hears... He is speaking mysteries by the Spirit. Here Paul is comparing these two gifts and the problem that this leads to if not used properly. That is the problem with the gift of tongues. There should be someone there to interpret. Verse 3. But he who prophesies speaks to men for edification, encouragement, and comfort. You see, the gift of prophecy stands on its own. It doesn't need an interpreter. 4. He who speaks of the tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. And that's what you want. That's your goal. Remember verse 1. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, especially that you as a church may prophesy well, this is what Paul's talking about. It's, it edifies the entire church. Then he goes into tongues thing. Verse 5, I wish you all spoke in tongues, but even more than you would prophesy. He's talking to them as a church. Would prophesy. That's in the plural. That you, plural, would prophesy. But greater is he who prophesies than he who speaks in a tongue, unless he interprets, you see, Interpretation of a tongue would be revelation to the church so that the church may receive edification. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I benefit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching? Now, even just a casual reading of this and the way we understand the English language clearly teaches that tongues was not to be used unless it was to be interpreted. It does the church no good. Verse 12, or point 12.
The gift of prophecy was the second highest gift in the local church next to apostle. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Then miracles, gifts of healings, helps, gifts of leadership, different kinds of tongues. Now the structure here of the language is really pretty clear. Paul ranks the first three gifts in importance. The apostleship had the most authority. It was also uh, accompanied with many other gifts such as prophecy, miracles, and so on, healing, and even tongues as Paul mentions. But then there was prophets, a revelatory gift that actually edified the church. And then there were teachers. Teachers are those who also edify the church, though they're not getting new revelation. 13. This is a point that I think people misunderstand perhaps in the past in my teaching, but hopefully it will be clarified as we move along on this subject. The gift of prophecy would soon go into abeyance. That means temporarily go idle. After the church was established, the canon completed, most revelatory gifts were stopped, but prophecy would come back in the form of the Old Testament prophet once again with Moses and Elijah, who will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Revelation 3 through 6. Let's continue with Romans 12.6 as we begin to look at the second part of this exhortation by Paul. Since we have different gifts according to grace, if prophecy, now that we know what prophecy means, let him use it according to the proportion of his faith. The word proportion Earlier we saw the word measure of faith. Now the word is proportion. Let me put it up as well as the explanation. Ananogia. You can see analytics, okay, logic in this. It's a mathematical or logical term, or logic term. Like you would have the right proportions in a building structure. In our use, it means right proportion. Now this is similar to the measure of faith we saw back in verse 3. But now in verse 6, we are told, according to the proportion of your faith, use your spiritual gift. I see this term as more precise than just measure. It's like we got the measuring cup and, and now this time we've got marks on it so we know exactly how much we have. Use your gift with precision in the local church. You know the boundaries of your gift, and they're marked by your faith, what you know of the Word, what you believe of the Word. This helps keep your gift and you in the right relationship with the body of Christ. And when I say in you, I mean keeps your attitude in line also. You don't get arrogant about it. So your faith helps guard you using your gift properly. Now, this is pertaining to the gift of prophecy, but I see no reason that it wouldn't work with other spiritual gifts also, particularly things like teaching. One has to be careful how he uses it, and we'll talk about that later. The idea is that you use your gift with precision in the local church. Your boundaries are your faith. Your faith helps keep your gift, you, in the right, right relationship with the body of Christ and, of course, your own attitude. So, let's say you become very popular as a speaker in a church. Whatever you do, it may be your prayer life. It may be uh, just encouraging people. Maybe you're a teacher. Somehow you're communicating to people. Maybe you're a leader. 
and people like to hear you speak and pray, or whatever you do. This may mean you have a gift of exhortation, because people feel encouraged. So, they often call on you. Here we're to understand. Know your limits. Don't get proud of it. Make sure you understand you're just a part of the body and, is, and others are just as important. All right? This passage is not saying, when it talks about proportion of faith, that some have more faith than others. Now, some may be stronger in their faith, but this is saying that you have the faith you need to use your gift, so use it, but do not get out of line with your gift. Maintain your dependence on the Spirit. Know your limitations. Keep yourself within the boundaries of the known word. And in the case of prophecy, in those days, it was what other prophets confirmed. Very easy, as I, I'm almost afraid to say, to misuse gifts like prophecy. Uh, it was a problem in the Old Testament. It's a problem in the New Testament. If believers think something is from God and it's really not. Uh, we see that today in teaching or some of the communication gifts where it's tempting for someone to throw in their opinion. Uh, whatever it may be about, maybe about politics, it may be about uh, one's view of something that is totally irrelevant regarding the church. But it's important that we make sure we distinguish between opinion and what the Word says. The gift is to be used to edify the church. And like the other gifts, it must be used with love. Point of advice. Don't sit on your gifts. If you have an important gift, especially in those days of prophecy, for example, a revelatory gift, can you imagine not giving the body of Christ something that God has for them? So they were to prophesy if those gifts were there. They weren't supposed to be kept under wraps. It may be something vital to the church. What if there was a famine coming and the prophet decided he wasn't going to say anything? You see, it was under his control. So, the point is, you use it with your faith. Your faith helps you use it properly. Of course, this would be true of all spiritual gifts. There's a lot of information here in this short verse and something that is helpful to us even today in the use of speaking and communication gifts. Verse 7. We've mentioned two more gifts. Paul writes, if service in his service. Okay, so what is Paul really saying here? The implication is use your gift. If you have the gift of service, use it. We can imply that verse or that verb here, if service, use it in your service. Or if teaching, use it in your teaching. Use your gift. Let's talk about service. This is a very common word we see in the New Testament. I expect most of you are familiar with it. Diakonia, it means service or minister. It's a word we often see in the context of a local church. The word is used both for service toward giving the gospel to the unbeliever, 2 Corinthians 5.8, and toward the body of Christ, the church, as we have it here. Here the focus is on serving the church. Now let's talk about just the general gift of service. Now I say general, I mean the spiritual gift of service. Not just everyday service by anybody. This is the spiritual gift of service. This is one who is specially gifted in helping others in some way and ministering to others in some way. He has a God-given ability to do it right, do it well, and actually minister to people. You know, it's one thing to take something over to someone who needs something, just kind of be a delivery man. It's another thing to deliver it with passion. 
Deliver it with motivation. Deliver with a heart that says, I really want to help these people. This can involve many areas. It may be distributing, it may be distributing or collecting funds. It may be clothing. It may be what people give. It may be serving communion. Today's church, you get ushers, people who care for the property and finances, and so on. These are service gifts. These are ministry gifts. People who are especially motivated. Now listen to this. By the Holy Spirit to do this God's way. And it's directed toward the church, the body of believers. Doesn't mean you can't minister to an unbeliever and tell them the gospel. That's the primary goal. Whatever you do with them, if you give them food, your goal is to give them the gospel. Um, think about it as just helping a starving unbeliever. Help them with food if they need it. At the same time, you want to lead them to Christ. One of the clearest examples of service was in the early church was the service or ministry towards the widows in Acts 6 1. But let me give you another example. I'll actually read this one from 1 Corinthians 16 15. Now I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanos, that they were the first fruits of Acacia, and that they have devoted themselves for ministry devoted themselves for ministry to the saints. This means that Stephanos' family, his servants, maybe people who worked for him, if there were some who were servants and worked for him, devoted themselves to serve the saints. Take them what they need. We're not told exactly what that is, but using one's imagination, perhaps they took them a copy of the scriptures. Perhaps they took them some food or some necessary uh, need, fulfilling some necessary need for them. Now in our churches today, and we need to really study the subject of the church soon because it's changed so much over the years that we need to get it back in the definition of what a church is. But in our churches today, service may come in many forms, helping people in numerous ways. Besides those we've already mentioned, it may be ministering to any number of needs for those who, one reason for the other, cannot temporarily or even permanently care for themselves. Reading the scripture to someone who's ill or can't see. Uh, taking care of their homes while they're hospitalized. Taking them to the doctor. Helping them find health care. A big issue here in the United States now it can be any number of things. The server does these things in the power of the Spirit, meeting both the physical and even spiritual needs of those served. Have you ever been ill or sick or down and out or just can't function normally for one reason or the other? And you hear someone's coming over and you're thrilled about it. Well, if it's a Christian who has the gift of service it may be you're thrilled to see him or her because they minister in a special way to you through the power of God you see alright the next part of this verse refers to teaching where Paul writes or if teaching use it in his teaching teaching is one of the most and most important gifts and main gifts in the church today. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Remember it was ranked after apostleship and prophets. Those two gifts are gone. What's left is the teacher. Now, the gift of teacher is not revelatory. Let's make sure we understand that. God has not given the teacher new revelation. He takes what revelation that is written in the scripture 
and teaches from that body of truth. It is also one of the most serious gifts. I say this because the responsibility is one of the highest, with stricter judgment, according to James 3, 1. Teachers come in different varieties and different levels. A good teacher is prepared to teach. He studies and confirms what he's going to teach with the Word of God before he teaches it, making sure that what he teaches is accurate. Now, if you want to know more about this, I talked quite a bit about it on the basic series on the Bible teacher, where I discuss the different levels and some of the training that's involved. No one should take the gift of teaching lightly, even if it's with children, especially with children. Point eight, excuse me, verse eight. We come to some more gifts. Let's read the whole verse. If exhortation in his exhorting, he who contributes with integrity, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let's talk about if exhortation in his exhorting. The word for exhortation, actually the verb, parakaleo, it means basically to call alongside. We get the definition of exhort or encourage, implore, or comfort. That's a pretty good range. Now we saw this exhortation earlier when Paul introduced this particular passage. We learned that it was something that is saying something about something that has already been taught. It's trying to get someone to do what they've already been taught. But an exhorter may also be someone who encourages with words and actions. You've heard people probably say, he always so, he's always so encouraging when he speaks. He always seems to say the right thing. He comforts me. Well, it also has the meaning of comfort. This would be someone who comforts the hurting, the grieving, the sick. That's probably the usage Paul has in mind here. It's someone who has encouraging words to say to others. And we need that in the body of Christ. We need people who will say something encouraging. There's a lot of discouraging things going on all the time, all around us, and sometimes even in the church. But we need people who say things that are encouraging. You know, they're the ones that see the good side of things. They're the ones who see the, the glass half full. They're the positive types. If exhortation in his exhorting. Use it, exhorting. Use your gift. This is what Paul is saying. The next one, he who contributes. Metadidomy, to give or share of what one has. Didomy means basically to give. Meta with, give with. Give with what you have. Share with somebody. John the Baptist taught in Luke 3.11, for we see this. In showing a repentant life, Listen to Luke 3.11. This is John the Baptist. John answered, The man with two tunics should share, there's our word, metadenomy, with one who has none. And the one who has food should do the same. Now John the Apostle wrote, 1 John 3.17 and 18, but whoever has the world's goods and see his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. It may be in money. It may be in abundance of something you have. Maybe you have a large wood robe. Maybe you have uh, a number of 
sets of sheets and blankets and things like that. And you know of some believers who don't have those things. Give them some of your stuff. And don't give them the worst stuff. Put yourself in their shoes. They're just going to bring us rags. You don't want people's throwaways. Neither do they. That's one of the problems I have with some of the people who give to some of these organizations. They go out and give their junk thinking that, well, God's going to bless me for this. Uh, well, where does it go? In fact, my understanding is some of these organizations just have all those clothes. They have so many of them, they just have them stripped into rags and sell them as rags. Not all, of course. Listen to Ephesians 4.28. He who has been stealing must steal no longer. Apparently the people in Ephesus, there was a number of poor people. And they had been stealing. Christians are said, stop it. But must work doing something useful with your own hands. That's not to be missed. We need to work. Even if it's the only job you can find. As long as it's moral within the bounds of scripture and it's not sinful it may be a crummy job we're supposed to work that he may have something to share there's our word metadenomy with those in need this is one reason we work so you can share with those in need now this says something about those who have a fixed income is that an excuse not to give don't let it be Now let's go back to our verse. If exhortation in his exhorting, he who contributes with integrity. The word integrity is an important part of the mental honesty that one should have when he contributes. The word is hoplotes. Let's see if I can get it up here. Hoplotes. Hoplotes, actually. It means a mental honesty, an uprightness. I think the word simplicity applies well here. That's one of the translations, one of the meanings. It means you don't have strings attached. I'll give if they'll do this. Or I'll give, but I expect this in return. That's not the kind of giving that Christians give. That's not giving motivated by the power of the Spirit and the Spirit of grace. It's not self-seeking. It's not hypocritical. So, contributing, sharing, giving with others who have need should be with a mental honesty and simplicity with no strings attached. In other words, giving should come with the right motive. The next part of this verse refers to leading, leadership. Proistomy, it means literally to stand over, to preside. Paul uses this word for the leader, the elder, the pastor of the church. All right, the exhortation, he who leads. Let's define leader a little bit more. Look at first. Thessalonians 5.12 But request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you. Same word. Priestomy. Who have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. 1 Timothy 5.17 The elders who rule. Same word. Well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. Okay. Leading should be done with diligence. Persistent, work hard at it. It's not just telling people what to do. You think through what you're doing, what you're saying, how you're leading, why you do what you do. You carefully make decisions and you work hard at it. 
you've really thought this thing over. Maybe you've analyzed it, you've put it on a board, how you're going to organize it, how you're going to say it, and how you're going to present it, you see. Finally, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. This is that person that I mentioned earlier. In his service, there's a certain attitude that goes with it. And showing mercy, one should show cheerfulness. And here's why. Because those who show mercy often go to some of the most serious in need. The very poor, the very needy, the very sick, those who are permanently um, handicapped, perhaps terminally ill. Uh, however you help them, you show a cheerfulness. You don't go in there showing self-pity. You don't go in there with a frown on your face, feeling just awful and shocked about their particular situation. This particular gift of mercy has with it an attitude of cheerfulness. You're controlled by the Spirit of God. You have a supernatural connection to that believer you're helping. And you uplift them with your cheerfulness. They're glad to see you. And you perpetuate that in your presence with them. You're not showing pity. You're not acting like you feel sorry for them. You're more than happy to do it. And you show it in your attitude and your countenance. Now this, of course, would require some spiritual growth. Sharing a cheerful attitude is important to those who are in dire need or the elderly person who's been sitting in that nursing home for days without a visitor, you see. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let's look at our last verse. Verse 8, the one we just went over. If exhortation in his exhorting. In other words, use your gift. He who contributes with integrity. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Well, we'll continue at this point next time. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, this has been a challenging set of verses for us, those of us who need to move to that level three and use our gifts. May we learn from the principles of these gifts that Paul has cited how to use our own gifts. First of all, to use them with the right attitude, with the control of the spirit, in the spirit of cheerfulness when necessary. We ask that you will help us apply these things and the power of your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen.